For the last several months, I've been working on and off of this Playdate game that's loosely inspired by The World's Hardest Game, a Flash game from about 15 years ago. I was revisiting the game recently, and it's held up surprisingly well. Maybe not the insane difficulty curve, but there's something addictive about trying to master the simple movement mechanics and narrowly dodge various obstacles. Sort of a timeless mechanic, you might say. I feel pretty nostalgic for this era of Flash games. I like that the games were a little rough around the edges, and that I could tell it was just one person's passion project. That's kind of why I like to play Date a lot. Just cool people making unique little games for fun. Considering the similarities between the platforms, I thought it would be interesting to take one of my favorite Flash games and reimagine it in my own style for the Playdate. My name is Atsu, and for the last couple of years I've been making stuff for the Playdate. And this is the story of how I made my latest game. So originally, I actually didn't set out to make this type of game. What really happened was, at this point, it had been about a year since I released my last game, and I was recovering from some burnout from game development and sitting at a graveyard of abandoned projects that I started and stopped in the last year. Unsurprisingly, giving up over and over again sucks, so I was determined to actually try and finish something to get myself back on track. The plan was simple, make the easiest possible prototype to code and test to see if it was any good. Easier said than done, but of all places, reading through the Playdate SDK documentation gave me an idea as I stumbled upon this innocuous function the sample function. Now what sample does is really simple. It just checks a specific pixel on an image and returns what the color is. However, what if this image was some sort of maze and you're controlling a player through the maze? Now, suppose you use the sample function at the same exact spot where the player is at. Theoretically, any time the sample function returns that there's a black pixel means that the player hit a wall and you can reset them back to the start of the maze. This way, instead of coding an entire level editor, I can just draw a bunch of different levels. Also, instead of having to deal with any collision technique, the sample function acts as our entire collision system. That leaves us with the player controller, but I already had an idea for that. In my last game, a vampire survivors-like game called Core Fault that I made with my friend Dave, I implemented a movement system where the player is constantly moving, and the crank angle determines the direction the player moves. I really liked how that movement system felt because of how the physical crank direction ties one-to-one -one with the movement. It's hard to convey through the screen, but it feels extremely analog. Also, it was only a couple of lines of code, where we take the angle of the crank and run a bit of trigonometry to get the direction. With that, I coded it up and drew a few test levels, and this is what it looked like. When you're prototyping something in game dev and just the basic gameplay feels really fun, you know you're onto something. And just moving around and maneuvering past these stationary walls felt really exciting. Not only that, but take a look at the code. It was only around 30 lines. First, just loading the level image and setting some parameters like the player's speed, size, and position. Then, in every frame, we first update the player's position based on the crank angle, use that sample function to reset the player's position if it detects the player's on a black pixel, offset drawing to simulate a camera, and then handle all the drawing. When I was messing around with this, this was the point where I started to feel that the gameplay reminded me of the world's hardest game, but with the player constantly moving instead of being controlled discreetly. Taking some inspiration from the game, I thought it was about time to start implementing some obstacles. The first mechanic that I wanted to try implementing was these sorts of spinny obstacles. I guess because I thought it'd be fun, and they're pretty iconic. Rotating stuff dynamically on the playdate is generally pretty slow performance-wise, so I typically pre-render everything into a giant sprite sheet instead. Here I have 90 different angles, and this was done automatically by this nice tool made by Samuele Zolfinelli. At this point, I switched over to proper sprite collision detection instead of my prototype sample solution, since I've already validated the idea, and there's this alpha collision function that checks for collisions on a per pixel basis. So that allows me to check for collisions on the spinner's irregular shape, despite the playdate's built-in collision only handling axis-aligned boxes. Next were these moving boxes that bounce when they hit a wall, which of course were inspired by the bouncing dots that show up as early as level 1. For the third mechanic, I started to deviate from the world's hardest game and thought it'd be fun to add in a little turret that shot out a projectile. Now, at this point, the limitations of my prototype were really starting to rear their head, and since I was pretty invested in the game, I thought it would be worth it to start rewriting everything properly. The first step was to handle the level progression. At this stage, I was still having to manually swap out the levels by replacing the image path and code and rebuild the project, which was obviously something I needed to change at some point. So I went ahead and made a temporary level transition animation, and by temporary, I mean it made it all the way to the final build. I also went ahead and inverted the colors, because for some reason it looks a lot better to me. I think it might be because all my first plated games just use a plain white background, and I've sort of associated that with an amateur look. I'd also like to point out that at this point, I was still manually inputting the coordinates 
for each of the hazards in the code, which meant I couldn't preview what the level looked like until I actually built and ran the game. Luckily, I had a solution for this. A little over a year ago, I made this tiny Metroidvania game called The King's Dungeon. For the game, I used this level editor called LDTK, along with the Playdate-specific importer library for LDTK made by Nick Menye. I totally forgot how I set that up, but I made a video about it, so I just watched my own tutorial. Now I can dynamically adjust hazards in the level editor, even setting things like the size and speed. And I just have to make sure to use that data passed over for the hazard initialization, and it just works. If you're curious about what that looks like in the code, I've actually made the entire project available on GitHub. I used to put my source code behind my Patreon, but I decided I didn't really like that, so all the source code from all my previous games are available on GitHub as well. My Patreon now just has one generic tier if you want to support my work. Anyways, the basic idea for the level editor stuff is that the LDTK data file is really just one giant JSON document. So the LDTK to Playdate library packages that all up nicely into Lua objects. And so we can loop over the list of entities, send it over to this block class I've created, and I can just extract the properties like the block size and the speed fields just by indexing into the object. At this stage, the level creation process looks like this. I have an image that serves as the walls of the level. I edit it in a sprite and link it to a level in LDTK. There, I add the start and end points of the level along with any hazards, and I adjust any properties like the speed or size of the block. Lastly, I build the project to test out the level and see if I need to tweak anything. The process is a little clunky for now, and it might cause some problems down the line, but we can get back to that later since the game is looking a bit plain. I think it's about time to spruce things up a bit. One thing that was annoying me when testing was that I couldn't directly jump to a stage. So I quickly threw together a level select using the Playdate's grid view element, which I also forget how to use all the time, so I watched my own tutorial again. You might notice that there's this level name section. I sort of like it when games individually name levels instead of just numbering them, so I added that in as a small thing. Of course, this is just another field that I can edit in LDTK that gets automatically updated. Just for a little extra juice, I put in this title sash to show the level title. At this point, I was getting a little tired of the player just being a plain circle, so I tried switching up the player art. This was the first idea, a kind of floating flame, which was something I copied from one of those unfinished games I mentioned from last year. Kind of a cross between a deck builder and a dungeon crawler. I thought it looked like medieval or something, so I tried adding these castle bricks, but I don't know, it wasn't really doing it for me. The background being black sort of reminded me of space, so I found this 1-bit sci-fi tile set on itch and made a mock-up, and I think it was looking pretty good. Just for good measure, I used this planet generator, ran it through this dithering tool made by Tim Pei, and plopped it into the background along with some stars, and it was really starting to come together. There was still the question about the player sprite, and I thought in a sci-fi environment, a sort of floating droid made some sense. I drew this, and it looked okay, but I wasn't really fully satisfied. I tried a second pass with this chunkier robot and adding a bit of animation, but I think this might have been worse. In an attempt to get some inspiration, I started looking into random games, and that's where I stumbled upon this. This propeller rat from Shovel Knight. The idea of a propeller rat was so funny to me. I used to have some pet rats, so I wanted to try and see if it would fit. I whipped up a 1-bit version and tested it out in the game, and surprisingly, I think it didn't look that out of place. I went ahead and animated the sprite, and at this point, I mean, uh, I was pretty much sold. Strangely enough, there already happens to be another Playdate game set in space where you play as a rat, but I guess that's just the type of platform that Playdate is. The next week or so, I spent a bunch of time polishing every element to match this new sci-fi style. First was to swap out all the hazards, so turning the blocks into these boxes, the spinner into a more substantial cross, and the turret into something a little more polished. It was kind of weird seeing them hit the wall and disappear, so I used this tool called Sprite Mancer to pre-render some particle effects, and gave the projectiles a breaking animation. I also swapped out the placeholder level end element with this teleporter thing, which I think looks pretty sci-fi. Also, instead of the player just randomly snapping to the start when they hit a hazard, I created this little animation where it looks like the player spins off the screen. Honestly, these polished things seem really small, but investing in these things makes the game seem way more professional, which I think is important for indies. If you remember, this is what it looked like before all the changes. I was pretty happy with the progress so far, but there was still something bugging me, and earlier I mentioned it might become a problem. At this point, I was still drawing levels by hand instead of using a tile map system, which was honestly kind of ridiculous. The reason I've been keeping the ability to draw levels was I originally thought I wanted to go for a hand-drawn aesthetic, and also it gave me more flexibility to make more organic wall shapes. However, that didn't really make any sense anymore, since I've inadvertently opted into a tile structure by using a tile set. Even though this wasn't directly related to the gameplay, this workflow stuff is still very much part of game dev. I went ahead and changed it to an auto-tiling system, and it felt so nice not having to switch back and forth between A-Sprite and LDTK. I can now build full levels completely in my level editor and immediately test it 
it in game. Since I was already here working on the level stuff, I thought I would take the chance to add a couple more mechanics. When I think of space hazards, lasers always come to mind, so I added this laser thing. It was working pretty well, so I took the time to polish it up a bit and add a charge animation to the ends. While I was testing the lasers though, I noticed that I could just rush past the lasers and not really engage with the hazards that much. In the world's hardest game, these coins really force you to interact with the levels in a different way, so I went ahead and added these chips as a pickup. The teleporter is disabled until you collect all the chips. Speaking of the world's hardest game, I was taking a look at the level select and I really liked the level previews they had. Since I already had all the data for the level elements, theoretically all I had to do was make some downscaled icons for each level object and draw everything smaller. Pop them into a scrolling list and you got yourself a level select. The level select was nice, but something felt a bit off. Turns out, it was because when I launched the game, it went straight to the level select, and I realized it was kind of weird because I was missing a proper title screen. I needed a title first, and since you're playing as a propeller rat, I thought of a very creative name. For the title, I made each letter into its own individual sprite, so I can animate them floating up like this, like they're flying in propellers, which I thought was a cute detail. There's also a 5% chance that the R in the propeller is a rat. When messing around with the levels, I naturally found myself wanting to speedrun each level. Which makes sense, the world's hardest game has one of the most watched speedruns of all time. I definitely wanted to do more with that later, like adding a timer. But the first thing I noticed was that this level title sash that I added was covering the level, so if you start too quickly, you couldn't even see yourself. That was messing with the flow of the speedrun a little bit, but I noticed in this playdate game called A Balanced Brew, they had this little slide-in effect for the level title that I liked, so I basically just copied that. A Balanced Brew also had this level and pop-up thingy, and I thought that was pretty important to have so the player could restart the level to try getting a faster time or choose to go back to the level select screen. So I put one together, trying to stick to that sci-fi UI style with random angled corners for no reason. I also noticed that the game was feeling pretty quiet, so I spent some time adding some sound effects. For music, I decided to try something new and make it myself this time. I heard FL Studio was pretty good, but it came with a pretty hefty price tag. But if it's good enough for Porter Robinson, it's good enough for me. So I bit the bullet and put something together. That's what's playing in the background right now. Now that the general level flow was complete, it really set in how little levels I had. I only had about 10 levels at the time, but most of the game content was going to be levels, so it was time to lock in. I had some experience before with level design with my tiny metroidvania, but for some reason this seemed more difficult. Even though there was only like 5 different level elements, there were so many ways I can combine them, and I really started to realize how much of a different skill set level design was from programming. Which makes sense because when you think about how it is at game studios, level designer is its own job. What I found helped to make it easier on myself was just to focus on one specific mechanic at a time. I started off with no hazards, just the walls which I can use to ease the player into the game and teach them specific strategies. For example, teaching how to make tight turns using this level. Once I started working on levels with hazards, things started to get interesting. Since I was basically just trying to think of ways to show off what functionality I programmed in. For example, for some of the block levels, I tried highlighting how I made it so blocks can bounce off each other, and in other levels I show how I can change the speed and size of the blocks. With the turrets, I can adjust the fire rate, offset the firing using a start delay, and set the direction and speed. So I tried showing that in a few different levels, and in this next level I showed that I made it so blocks can stop projectiles, which was not how it worked initially. The laser also has some similar properties to the turret that can be adjusted, but also the end positions can be moved anywhere and it will automatically draw the laser line between them. So in the laser levels, I try putting them in different orientations. The spinners can have their turn speed adjusted, but what's interesting is I made it so you can actually put a negative speed to make it turn in the opposite direction. So for the spinner levels, I tried to have a mix of different speeds. I ended up making 70 different levels split up into 7 worlds of 10, and since there's some distinct sections, I thought it would be cool to have some sort of world select as well, since it seems like every sci-fi game has a planet selection screen. Now that I had all the levels finished, I was finally ready to start the most important part of developing a game. Playtesting was especially important for this game since I wanted to make sure the difficulty of the curve wasn't too steep so players didn't quit out partway through. I know I said that it's inspired by the world's hardest game, but that was more on the mechanic side of things. I need someone else to test since I can't tell myself as I designed the levels and played them a bunch. So the first person I sent it over to playtest was Dave, who I mentioned earlier made core fault to me. I'm a little concerned about like what my initial direction is, uh... especially in like tight spaces. But yeah, you can see how it's sticking out the corner from the rounded corner. Like kind it of makes sense to me that the that the propeller would get hit, but um, 
Oh yeah, era. Does it count the number of deaths? No, it doesn't. I was I sure. Know. I was like trying to think of whether I should or not. How hmm. would you feel about light story? We ended up talking for more than an hour as they were working through the levels, and I got a lot of great feedback. So much great feedback, in fact, that I ended up with a giant list of things to do, and I didn't end up conducting any more playtests so I can focus on addressing all those changes. Yeah, I, I know what I said, but I was like six months into the project, almost gave up a couple times, and I was so ready to put this game behind me. But you know what? Lesson learned, do more playtesting throughout development instead of all of it at the end. Anyways, it was time for the final push and to get this thing shipped. Ever hear about how the first 90% of game development takes 90% of the time, and the last little 10% of game development also takes 90% of the time? Well, here's what that last 10% looks like. Remember the speed running part I mentioned? I needed a timer in the level, but now I need to display your best time somehow, so I need to show the level times in the level select screen. I also wanted the leaderboard for the fastest total time in each world, so I need to add some display for that too. But then when I was testing, I found that in some of the more busy levels, I was getting some frame drops, which was originally not too noticeable, but now I'm recording the speedrun times, it was making the times inconsistent. Here the solution was to use delta time, which scales values based on how much time has passed in between each frame, which could be slightly different each time and longer if the game has to run a lot of stuff in one frame and goes over time. You can see here that I'm using delta time for the player, but not the projectiles, so the projectiles start slowing down, but the player keeps moving at the same speed even though the frame rate is dropping. Of course, that was a whole ordeal to overhaul all the physics to use that instead. Next, Dave also mentioned that there was no instructions, and it was a bit disorienting to see which direction you would move at the start, so I added a bit of help text and an arrow to highlight what your start direction is. There was also a few times in some of the tricky levels where the hitbox felt a bit unfair, especially on corners and times where it seemed like you should be able to pick up the chips with your tail, so I made the player hitbox smaller and the pickup hitbox way bigger. Another thing they noticed was that the lasers didn't have any indication of where they would be firing, so I added this flashing indicator. However, there's actually an accessibility setting on the playdate called Reduce Flashing that you can check against, so I also need to make sure to make a non-flashing version as well. I didn't mention this yet, but I had actually implemented a world locking system where you couldn't move on to the next world without completing all the levels from the previous world. They thought that was a little restrictive, and I agreed since you can get randomly stuck on a single level and you wouldn't be able to proceed and just come back to it later. Mobile games have been addressing this for ages, usually doing some sort of star system and unlocking levels based on the star count. I ended up doing something similar, but this time based on level completion. I added this little animation if you finished the level that gave you a flag, and each world has a certain number of flags that are required for it to unlock. The last world is a lot harder than the other worlds, so I can adjust the number of flags needed to unlock that one to be higher. Lastly, I added this bar to show your progress in a world throughout the game, just so you wouldn't be surprised when you finish all the levels and feel disappointed. And also a death count in the corner, just for fun. This was meant to be the final build, but when I submitted my game to Catalog, the game store for the playdate, I actually had about another month or so before the game was released. Why not add a bit more content? So I ended up making another world for a total of 80 levels, and I made this leaderboard display that connects to the online leaderboard. I was also working with Ray, an artist and developer in the Playdate community, on the cover art for my game, which turned out great. By the way, their game Hexa is out right now, which you should definitely check out as well. Anyways, they made this portrait for the on-device store art, and I thought, if I had a bit of story, I could use this in my game. So I set up a whole dialogue system to show a bit of a light story where in the future, we train rats as mechanics for spaceships, and you play as a rat named Little Dipper who is training to become one. With that, I was finally finished with the project. I'm feeling pretty motivated again after finally finishing this project, so I'll probably see you soon with some new videos. If you're interested in getting the game, it's currently available on Catalog and Itch.io. Thanks for watching, and see you next time.